Hello, everybody, and welcome to the HTML All The Things podcast, episode number 11, Box, Flexbox, and Grid. I'm your host, Matt Lawrence, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Mike Coran. What have you been up to this week, Mike? Hey, Matt. So, uh, this week, had a little bit of networking issues. I uh, had to get those solved. It's kind of annoying. Uh, so, had a ha- router at home kind of... I guess crapped out. Like I'm not even. I'm not even sure. It was just random intermittent. Some web pages not working. Some Skype calls not working. That was when I was like, okay, it's got to change now because I use I use Skype for my business meetings, and I had a situation where I a I didn't receive a message and b I couldn't even like send a call, uh, so that that was bad. So went out and bought like a mesh router system. Right. Uh, yeah, you know, like the the Google mesh ones, but like I decided to get something a little bit cheaper. Um, because I didn't want to spend all that money on Google Mesh right now since I've never used a mesh system. Uh, so I, I got these things called the TP-Link Deco routers, and I set them up today, and they've been pretty pretty solid. Like, they're all... There's two of them in my house right now. Uh, there's twos and three packs. I, I figured a two-pack would probably suffice for my house. And it's definitely servicing the whole house. Like, I'm getting really good connection in areas where I got, like, not really good before so i'm pretty happy with that um so i figured i figured i'd just let everyone know that these these routers are actually decent and i'll i think we'll leave a sponsored link or in the uh, not a sponsor but an affiliate link in the show notes in case you guys want to check them out uh the other thing i was working on and released was the actual uh, next part of the Vue.js guide uh we're building like learning to build pages dynamically with json there and it's uh it's released in it's going pretty good. Hopefully, everyone checks it out. I think uh, we'll do a follow-up episode at some point on Vue.js. Uh, I don't know if it's probably not next week, but maybe the week after that. So stay tuned for that. Uh, what about you, Matt? Uh, so I've been basically, as as we've been discussing the last few weeks, I've been kind of focusing more on HTML, all the things. This week's been no exception. Uh, so what I've been trying to develop is a, a faster writing skill. So I used to write quite a bit uh, for for a couple of technical publications and I was like, I kind of got really good at really quickly writing stuff out, but I'm kind of out of practice. Like I still kind of write in the same style that I was before for sure, but I am kind of out of practice in writing quickly and coming up with the ideas quickly. So I kind of started banging out a couple of articles. I haven't actually published a couple. I've only published one, but I've like, you know, kind of started them. I'm just trying to like trying to branch out and like I've written like half paragraphs of some and stuff like that just to try to get some out. And I have one out now. Uh, regarding smart speakers and how uh, they're kind of like the next level of uh, computing that's not on html the things that's just on my medium blog but that's i'm working basically toward getting faster writing and then hopefully i'll be able to write you know more frequently and faster for html the things so i'm just kind of like trying to develop writing in general i've also been working on the subreddit so a lot of it's been the back end you know you guys probably haven't noticed much maybe a couple of color changes on post flares or something like that but i have been working on the subreddit and been posting on there and we have a new subscriber on there too so our new follower whatever they call it on reddit so it's been it's been going well um so if you guys want to go check that out you know give it a go share your own work on there of course we want everyone to kind of discuss and and uh, have a bit of a conversation on there because uh you know we repost a lot of stuff also on instagram and that type of thing because the most interesting stuff in this industry of course comes from you know the the vast amount of opinions and different like uis that people make and stuff like that so uh for Mm -hmm. sure Anyway, but uh, I think we'll get into the the actual episode as we normally do. So we have a few segments for you. Of course, the recurring segment, web news, as we always do. Um, so segment number one is going to be the layout models. It's going to be a brief overview. It has a few subsections uh, that apply to the various to the various uh, like models that we have there. We have segment number two, which is box versus flex box versus grid. So this is just more of a direct comparison, Um, a little bit more editorialized in this segment. We're going to kind of talk about our experiences with them, um, what we use them for, what are like what we thought was easiest to use, what we think of them, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a couple of subsections and a lot of talking points there. And then we don't have a third segment this week. We only have the two because uh, we have uh, we kind of have a loaded second segment, as I said, but we also have a loaded web news this week, and this is going to be unobtrusive ads. And of course, this is a highly opinionated uh, piece here, so this is definitely going to you know trigger some conversation about that for sure. And I think we should just uh, sort of dive right in. Let's uh, let's go right into it. So 
I'm just going to kind of go over a brief introduction before I jump into the first segment here. So of course we're talking about CSS layout methods. So there's the box, the flex box, and the grid, and they're kind of like evolutions of each other as things on the web have evolved from tables, which are, you know, pre, pre these things versus, you know, getting closer, getting, you know, easier to lay out, you know, using more CSS rather than inline styles and like just tables to lay things out. And then eventually, of course, now we have, you know, responsive designs, various screen sizes, you know, not everyone is on a big IBM uh, CRT monitor anymore as it was back in the day. So that's, uh, that's, you know, that's, this is the evolution of the industry. Um, so we're going to jump into the first segment here, uh, layout models. And I do want to say that uh, I did grab a couple of points from a, an article um, that I found on a website called uh, Stack Chief, and uh, that will be linked in the description or slash the show notes as it always is. But the first subsection here is the box model. So the box model is sort of, um, I want to call it, I mean, it's in, it's tech old, right? Like it's not like super old. It's not 40 years old or anything ridiculous, but it's old, but it's still viable. So it was kind of used alongside um, when tables were kind of used for, when tables were kind of used for uh, layout. So if you don't know HTML tables, like so if you're just driving into the industry right now, uh, back, way back, they used to use tables for layouts to try to get like sort of like a grid kind of setup. So they would have like, oh, my sidebar is going to be this cell in my table and my content is going to be these cells in my table. So that, that that's kind of how they did things until the, until the box model kind of came along. And we've seen a variety of sites where people are trying to update, especially from, you know, rather old sites where people have you know, use tables exclusively or use them actually in tandem with the box model because people started to, you know, update the content and realize like, whoa, this is pretty old. Maybe we should add a couple of boxes, a couple of divs to the bottom of this when we add like a new uh, content block. So we see kind of like, you know, a hybrid. So this, like, that's kind of like the transition. Um, basically, um, in the box, in the box model, um, in the box model there, you can have like a basic, basic element breakdown. So what it, what it is, is it, it, there, it comprises of four parts. So it comprises of the content. It comprises of the padding, the border and the margin. So if you think about like a square or like a rectangle, you have the content right in the middle. So that might be like your image or <clears throat> excuse me, maybe your, maybe your written text, maybe a title, something like that. Then you have your actual padding. So the padding is the space in between the actual content. So let's say the writing to the outside edges. So if you imagine a box with like an actual just solid border, um, like a little outline, maybe like a one pixel wide black outline. And then there's like the content in the middle and maybe there's like 10 pixels all the way around from the content to the border. That's your padding. That's that space in between. Then of course you have your actual border. As I mentioned, you can have various styles there. Um, I mentioned the one pixel solid uh, solid black kind of outside, but you can do different different colors, different thicknesses. You can have them be solid. You can have them be dotted. There's a couple of different uh, styles with them and that type of thing. That's your element breakdown in the box model. So that's your, that's your single element. That's your element that's just sitting there by itself. But then you got to think, well, we're going to have multiple elements, like for example, multiple content boxes that are sitting around um, sitting around like on the page, of course, because you have multiple elements on a page and that's going to be controlled, uh, by margins. That's going to be controlled by borders. Uh, that's going to be controlled by the padding that we mentioned. So like you can kind of push things away with clear space. You can have the borders, you can have margins pushing things away from the outside. You can have, um, borders kind of like separating things if you want them right up against each other, but want clear separators. So that's like the spatial relationship. When you start introducing more elements, you can use those, those elements, like I said, margin border and padding to sort of like, you know, decide how you want things. Do you want there to be space in between? Do you want them to be up against each other, but have the content, have some space, maybe add some padding, that type of thing. You can also set dimensions for stuff. So for example, if you wanted something to specifically be 250 pixels high and 300 pixels wide, you can absolutely do that. Um, and then of course with the box model, uh, you always, you also have floats now full disclosure. I don't really use floats. I always thought floats were kind of messy. Um, however, I do use floats for, um, one of its most common uses and probably one of its simplest uses, which is to wrap text around an image. So, you know, just real easy example. If you have a paragraph and you want there to be an image kind of in there and you want the text to wrap around said image, you would use a float and have like the content and or the picture like float one way and then have the the text kind of like wrap around it there. Um, however, when you do that, of course, you then have and and we've seen this a lot. I've seen this a lot in a lot of templates and a lot of like pre-built pre-built web pages where you have a lot of clear fixes that come up. So you basically you have to use the clear property and the clear property specifies which elements can float beside 
uh, the clear element and uh, on which side of, of said element. Um, and like I said, there's a bunch of clear fixes out there. A lot of, a lot of time you'll have, um, a class literally just called clear fix. And, uh, I'm going to link an H or a, a W3 schools, um, a, a link in this, in the show notes to sort of like show you, because there's a, there's a couple of, uh, pretty good clear fixes and a pretty good outline of the box model, um, on there as well. Now we're going to move on to the second second uh, subsection here, which is the flex box. So the flex box is essentially the, um, in my opinion, it's sort of like the evolution of the box model, and it allows for easier CSS layouts when dealing with responsive web pages. So you basically how how it's set out is like so in the box model, like I said, there was kind of like your element, and then you had like your border, your padding, and your margin there. That's sort of that's sort of like the the basics, the, the the foundation of the box model. Well, inside a flexbox or with a flexbox, the, the the basic structure is you'll have like a wrapper, and that's called a flex container. And then inside of those, so the child elements, those are the flex items, and they get manipulated via various properties. And the various properties that can be placed upon a flex container are flex direction, justify content, and align items. And there's also some that I use less frequently um, or not at all uh, is align content, flex wrap, and flex flow. So those are the ones that you kind of play. So you, you basically have a container and you place those properties, the, one, the ones that you need on the flex container and that'll manipulate the items within the container. So if you imagine it, you would have, let's say a three column, a three column, like you have three blocks, right? So like three different descriptions on a home page, and they're, they're aligned left to right, right? So you basically have your flex container would wrap all three of those boxes. Each one of those boxes would be a flex item. And then you might have a nested flex item, or maybe even a nested uh, box model or a nested something else um, inside of there to align the content within those boxes. So that's just kind of like a brief description of how Flexbox works. Um, and it's one, it's for one dimensional layouts. So you, for, so for example, you have like your flex direction, which is either column or row. So that's left to right or up and down. And you can all, also flip those directions as well. So you could, in the DOM, you could have something come up as like, you know, there's the first element, the second element, and then the third element. So that'll go like left to right, one, two, three. You can actually flip those orders and go three, two, one with just a CSS property with Flexbox, uh, which is quite helpful. So Flexbox kind of specializes in responsive layouts and allows for much easier control over elements that need to adjust as the screen size changes. Um, in the box model, you had to control this, as I've mentioned before, with wrapping things, with uh, with uh, dimensions, with different methodologies to make sure that items would actually wrap around. So like what I'm talking about when I say wrap there is sort of like a text wrap, so it goes to like the next line. You kind of had to like it worked, but it was kind of hacky with the box model. So this is like an evolution where, you know, the elements or the, the behaviors that you were producing in box model are kind of native to Flexbox. Like having boxes go, you know, left to right and then on mobile they'd go up to down, right? The the row and the column, that that type of thing. Um, and elements are more seamlessly controlled. So kind of like what I mentioned there via justify content and uh, align items properties. So for example, in, for example, um, on smaller displays, the flex direction would get flipped from uh, row to column. So it's sort of like, like I mentioned with those three boxes, they'd be left to right, but let's say you start getting your screen size way down and you're on, you're now on a smartphone. It goes top to bottom, one, two, three, those three boxes. Um, now I'm going to move on to the next subseg subsection here, and I'm going to pass that actually on to Mike, and he's going to cover a grid or CSS grid, as it's more commonly known. Mm -hmm. All right, Matt. So I'll get into grid. Uh, so pretty much grid is just like the other models, but it's the, I guess the evolution would say of Flexbox um, with a little bit of table mixed in almost. You, you can imagine it like that. So uh, you just to set it, you just do a display grid property or inline grid. Uh, and the big the big thing here is that it's a multi-direction layout, so it's two-dimensional, which means that you're you're doing columns and rows all in the same box, all in the same div, in the same container, uh, which is great for laying out stuff. Like it's we'll, we'll get into more of our experiences with it in the next section, but like imagine laying out a whole web page in one container without having to do a bunch of nested divs. Uh, so pretty much you can customize each and every property of the grid. So the number of rows, the number of columns in the grid, uh, you can customize the size of each row and each column per row and per column. It doesn't have to be like one size set all, uh, it can be in any element, any, uh, metric you want. So pixels, percent, view height, view width, auto, however you want it. Um, you can do the spacing in between each row and column. 
So you can imagine how flexible a CSS grid layout can be. Uh, it's it's extremely, it's it's very visual when you see it. So you can you can say it like it's a, an, any item can be placed into a coordinate system. That's how visual it is. Like you can literally specify a coordinate uh, based on the number of rows and columns you specified and put an item there. Uh, you can do it based on numbers, just like you would if you if you're into more of a number based coordinate system. Or there's another way to do it with actual grid template areas. This is another CSS property of the CSS grid, where you can actually put text based coordinates. So you can you can make a text based grid. Uh, it's a little bit hard to explain uh, with with words, but imagine imagine having like three rows. The first row you would just put if you want four. Four columns, you would put actually like header, 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 header on on top of that. And that, and that makes a four column row that's all header. Then maybe the second the second, uh, the second second row, you want uh, two mains. So that's like your main content area. So main, main, space, main. And then you want like a blank. So you want just like a space in between like a content. So you put a dot. That's how you do blanks in CSS grid. And then on the right, you put sidebar. So these all represent different grid areas inside of your CSS grid and you can and you, while you're using these words like you're using actual words to represent uh, rows and columns right so when you're actually designing and putting that making that row all you have to do is give it a name so a, a call like a, a, the grid name of header and it'll take up all four of those uh, all four that you just mentioned there with header 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 it'll take up that entire top section just like you just like you put there and when you're putting the html layout you're also laying them like it's very clean because you're just writing you know class header and you don't have to put it into you don't have to encapsulate it into a bunch of different divs to make it a row or a column like usually with uh, with block model you would have to make a, a row for a row uh, div first and then inside of that row div you would put like a, a header and you'd have to put a couple a couple other things in there but here you could just make one div just call it a just call it a header, and it'll place it based on the CSS property header that you've created. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to explain uh, tech, through text. So we're gonna provide some links. Uh, CSS Tricks actually has some really good articles on it. That's where I kind of started learning uh, CSS Grid. Uh, so I will provide some links for that. Um, but other than that, so another thing I really like about it is I like to do a lot of uh, like napkin drawings, and mainly because I suck at regular drawings, so I kind of compensate by using a you know a crappy napkin. Uh, so I, 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 and when you're, when you're laying out, when you're laying out something on a napkin, uh, you can easily do it with CSS, like you can easily picture it with CSS grid because you just kind of put a box around each and every section and write like, oh, this is going to be the header. Uh, this is going to be the main content. This is going like put a box around that. That's going to be the sidebar. And then you can easily translate that directly onto, into CSS code. Uh, I really like that about it. I like to, I like to combine my visual with my text with my programming uh, w when I when I can because it gives an easier like it's easier to to program in the end when you actually have a visual product when you're just kind of doing it based on something in your head it's a little bit harder and you you, you generally make more more mistakes. Uh, so another thing is is that um, since this is a newer uh, property. CSS grid, it's not supported by all the browsers, but recently over the past year or so, all the major browsers do have support for it. We'll get more into compatibility later, but just, just know that it's not the most supported of all the things. If you're, if you have to design something for, you know, the, your 70 year old grandfather's, uh, you know, club or something like that, and you know, they're going to be using old, you know, XP computers with Internet Explorer on it, it you might want to stay away from this. But other than that, I think it's a it's a pretty fair game, to, pretty fair game to use. Um, but other than that, I think that's it. I think we've got, I think we've covered the three main display properties, right? Yeah, the three main uh, layout models of, of CSS yeah. for sure. Um, like, like I mean, there's there's the whole table thing, but that's so old yeah. and it really shouldn't be used. Like it was kind of a, a hack of its day, and these are the the product of trying to figure that out right it's like oh we use tables and then people are like oh man we have tables to do this certain thing let's you know evolve from box to flex to to grid so yeah exactly so yeah i think we should just move on to the next section where we can kind of have a back and forth conversation about how we've used them uh and our experience with the all three of these models so i'll pass it off to you matt 
Yeah, so segment number two here, we're going to do a comparison of uh, box versus flex box versus grid. So I'm going to start out here with responsivity. So uh, full disclaimer, I, I haven't used grid myself. I haven't been on a project in which it requires grid. Grid is quite new. So just, just uh, full disclaimer there, I have used a, a box model as well as uh, Flexbox quite extensively though. So that's sort of like where my uh, particular uh, skills lie, my first-hand experience. But I have seen quite a bit on grid, so just disclaimer there. But Yeah, and I'll, and I'll jump in and kind of fill out the grid. I've used it. I've also haven't used it extensively, but I've used it for a few projects. So Yeah, so you at least have some of that. Because it is so yeah. new, right? Like everyone is yeah, the I most new at yeah. that. <laughs> so Exactly. Um. We have all so we've we've all we've used all three of those of the uh, of the responsive layout method. So the but uh, many many of our current projects or many of the projects that we did in the beginning, I really should say that are live today are actually still box models. So despite the fact that we've used all those different types of layout methods, um, a lot of them are still box model. Box model um, is still supported across all the browsers, including Internet Explorer. So if you're looking for older compatibility, it is uh, obviously the oldest layout method um, that we've covered today, the oldest layout method in CSS that I'm aware of anyway. And basically it's it's still like the reason why I mentioned it is because it's still viable. So we've never done anything that hasn't been responsive. The first thing that we said when we dove into this industry and decided to learn it firsthand uh, to become prof to become professionals in the industry was okay. Well, we know the phones are big. Obviously, at the time, uh, we know the phones are big. I think the S5 was out when we started or something like that, and it was like okay, like you know, phones are big, tablets are big. Touch devices are big and different screens are all over the place, different size screens. So we're going to learn responsivity for everything. And a lot of that, a lot of our stuff is in fact box models. So in other words, like if you're, you know, sitting there right now thinking, oh shoot, I'm halfway through a project. I'm using box model right now. Maybe I should be using Flexbox. Maybe I should be using grid. Well, maybe that's true, but there's absolutely no reason for you to, you know, tear up what you've done or anything. You can use the various methods, um, you know, in tandem with each other. You can use a little box model uh, with, with a little bit of grid, with a little bit of flex box. There's no problem there. But if you want to continue with just box model, it's still absolutely viable. You know, modern phones, we have a lot of projects, like I said, in production and modern phones render box model perfectly fine. It's still responsive. It still works. And there's, you know, the customer isn't, you know, generally isn't technical. He's not looking in at the code and saying like, oh, why isn't this flex or why isn't this like grid? It still works and it like still does all the goals and there's no weird hacks or anything going on uh, with that. I would say that um, box model um, is the most challenging, however, to get working with responsivity. So things like... Um, a lot, I have to use a lot more calcs, for example, um, in properties. Uh, vertical alignment isn't as seamless as it is certainly with uh, Flexbox. Like vertical alignment kind of has a couple of CSS methods and there's a couple of little, um, I want to call them hacky things, but a couple of little methods that you have to do for vertical alignment. Whereas with Flexbox, it's very, very simple. It's just simply uh, aligning or justifying um, your items uh, so that it you know becomes dead center if that's what you're going for. It's very it's very seamless in Flexbox, whereas with Box Model it requires a little bit more uh, hand holding. Um, and I also find that Box Model, at least personally, wasn't really designed with responsivity in mind. Um, or if it was, it's more of a Gen. It's more of like a Gen One product, which it really is. So it's one of the uh, the first things that people started doing in CSS in terms of layouts, and it's it's very you you have to kind of micromanage the parts so it's like you have to really micromanage um your various pieces when you're doing responsivity um i find that i use a lot more media queries when i am using box model um, especially on complex sites you know it's different for every project depending on their complexity but if it's a complex if it's a complex site uh generally i'll have more media queries to correct things at certain resolutions when i'm using box model um and of course there's exceptions to every rule but that's just sort of a generality there um also, uh, so flex, Flexbox and Grid, like I already said, are by far the easiest for uh, responsivity. And when I say that, it they can actually save you or save us like like several hours of development time in some cases. So when we were first learning, we learned the box model, or at least I did, and then I switched to Flexbox, and I found it a little bit harder to pick up. Flexbox was, but. It, like once I figured out what the heck was going on, I was literally like slinging pages together, like basic pages together in in seconds uh, in comparison to what I was doing with the box model with like trying to correct weird vertical alignments and, and other stuff like that. Um, I think I'll pass it on to uh, Mike to talk about uh, the different layouts that we've uh, kind of experienced. 
Uh, no, I'm going to talk about responsivity for a little bit longer. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, I have a few things to add there. So with with Flexbox and, like, I, I've i mainly used Flexbox and Grid, I would say. Like, I have definitely used Box Model when initially, and I kind of, like, banged my head against a table uh, with Box Model. Um, because I really didn't like the like the, the alignment, right? Like, whenever I would ask you questions, what was it about? It was 90% about, like, why isn't this aligning to center? Why isn't this, like, why can I not vertically align? Like, it's not possible to vertically align a div inside of another div. I Without calculations, without knowing the exact height of the divs and stuff like that, like, it, it, it blew my mind. Um, but when I went to Flexbox and I saw that you can, you know, justify content center, align item center, done. That's center. That's centering everything. You know, do everything in percents. Do everything in view heights or uh, view widths, and you got a, you got yourself a responsive page. That was huge for me. Uh, that's that literally like you like you said. It literally saved me hours of work um, because because of that. And it just it was really consistent too. Like so, one I could really apply the same technique for every single project. Whereas block model, uh, based on the layout that you had, I would have to think of a whole new technique. That's what killed me. Like, I would have to, you know, is this going to be an inline block? Is this going to be a regular block? Am I going to have to vertical align it this way? Like, is this just text because I'm vertical aligning text? So I, maybe I can just do, you know, vertical align text because that's easier. Um, anyway, I like, so I have to really think of different and more m- different ways of doing responsivity. But another another thing is grid. Like, I just want to talk a little bit more about grid uh, for that. And the cool thing about it is you still use you still use media queries for grid, but like I said with those um, those named call like named sections, you can just redesign a grid template area for each and every media query. So if you don't want your main section to be beside your sidebar, then just make another row and put it put your sidebar on another row, and all you have to do is just change your grid template area because that's where all of your that's where your structure is. Uh, your named structure is and if you just change that that's all you have to do it's a one it's a one css change uh thing you don't have to change any html you don't have to do anything else you literally just add add another row into a grid template area done uh it's it to me that that seems the simplest and that's i think it's the future of of design like once once we get into like a more personal project i'm definitely going to go into css grid where I don't have to worry about backwards compatibility to IE or backwards compatibility to even Edge, uh, like older versions of Edge. Um, I'm definitely going to go with CSS Grid. But another thing is like uh, these the, some suggestions I've heard for using resp- uh, responsivity in CSS Grid and for using maybe a different support uh, way of doing it is maybe designing mobile first. And mobile can be using just like regular Flexbox, right? And then building out your larger screens after. And your larger screens and more complex screens can use CSS Grid. And then if, worst case scenario, someone goes onto it with an unsupported device, they at least see a clean mobile layout. And that's probably not going to be as jarring as seeing, you know, everything misaligned and no, no styling at all if, if Grid's not supported. Uh, so that, that's kind of like a suggestion that I've been, I've been told to use. Uh, and now I'll, I'll just move on to like how, how I use how I used all three for layouts, just simple, uh, simple layout mechanisms. So pretty much with, with all three of them, I have designed basic sites and all three, I think are suitable. No problem for a basic, you know, uh, header section, main section footer site. I don't think there's any, there's really much of a difference to be honest. Uh, it, it, it gets into the more way, like the more complex sites where you have a, 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 a big grid area, like a lot of content in one area, uh, sections broken up with image, then text, image, text, those kinds of sections where Flexbox and Grid kind of, you know, separate themselves from the box model. Um, and I've done quite a few, uh, quite a few of those sites recently. Like I've done quite a few pages where I had to really, like the design was very, very complex compared to what else what, what other things that i've done like many many sections all the sections had sections within them with with different kind of like points and then images images beside the points like when you when you have like let's say a, a bullet and then a bullet point and then to the left of that you have an image and you need to center the image the the bullet point to the image you kind of you, you kind of run into an issue with the block model because uh, you would have to again do the calculation as as far as I know like maybe I'm I'm wrong on this Matt, like 
Matt, do you know of any other way to vertically align an Im like text to an image on the left hand side with with block model? I'm just trying to think with. Um, I mean, off the top, with especially with an LI, I think you might run into problems. Like, I think you might yeah. be right there, just off the top. Like, it'd be it'd be something I'd have to look at. But I like it. it that that's just it. Is like I, I think it's I, I think you're right. Like, it's something I would have to look up because like I'm not yeah. sure on that. You know. Exactly. So I think it would be like, and then with Flexbox, you literally just go uh, make it you know uh, align item center, justify content center. Yeah. You could also, you, again, you can also justify content uh, flex start, flex end, depending on how you want, like where you want your content to be aligned. But it's just it's very simple, and and it's it's very intuitive as well. That's what I found. Like it's it's not like oh okay I have to go in and look out how to do this. Like no, I can just you know if you need to align content, you literally use align content. I, I um, if, so, if if I may jump in just for one sec, yeah, it on. almost sounds like it almost sounds like you the layouts like these various layout methods, I just kind of thought of this, is it's starting to, they're starting to in, inherit what frameworks do for us or like libraries do for us. So it's like with box model, we used to have like a lot of people would rely on the grid method that like, you know, let's say bootstrap has, it still has it, but like a lot mm -hmm. of people would rely on the grid and then like kind of boxes were a little bit like flaky, let's say. And then, mm -hmm. then, you know, Bootstrap kind of adopts Flexbox, but it's like, that's a native feature now as well in CSS. And then now we have CSS grid. So it's almost like the CSS spec essentially is being updated alongside what, what functionality is needed that these libraries and these like frameworks were doing. So it's like, you yeah. know, there was a need for grid way before there was a, there was CSS grid. That was a native feature. There was a need for Flexbox way before there was a Flexbox and there was a need for box way before there was that box like css like the box model was introduced so just so something i've just kind of thought of off the cuff there yeah that, that exactly that makes sense and then you you can also speaking of the all three right you can also combine them so if if you're if you have a situation where you have a one-dimensional component of a site so like a nav bar is a good example Flexbox does that perfectly. Not to say that CSS Grid can't do one-dimensional. It can do one-dimensional, no problem. It's just maybe you're you're really familiar with Flexbox and you've done a million nav bars in Flexbox, but you still want to do CSS Grid for the actual content structure of the site. So make you know a header section and then just put a CSS a Flexbox nav bar into that header section. That's no, there's that's fully compatible. That's actually a very common thing that people do. Uh, and then again, inside, like you can make content blocks inside inside of each uh, inside of your grids, right? And inside of there, you can use box if you're if you're really familiar with box for each and every like little you know content block with a picture and some text under it. Uh, that's fine too. Like there's not there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing there's no issue with that. And I ha I've done that myself. Um, it's it's familiarity. It's it's what you need. Like if you have an infinite amount of time to work on it, and if if you want to learn something new, maybe it's worthwhile to do everything in CSS grid. Uh, because you're learning a new technology and stuff like that. But who has that time? Like who has, who's working on, on their, uh, you know, client's project and they give them infinite amounts of time. No, you want to do it as fast as possible. You also want to make sure that you're, you're still keeping up with new technologies. So you can kind of slowly combine them. So maybe you're more like comfortable just doing the structure, do that with CSS grid, do everything else in something that you already know. Um, so anything like anything that requires a two-dimensional structure, like I was mentioning before, like a full website layout, uh, especially if there's multiple components in the website, not just a you know header content footer, uh, then I would definitely still recommend using CSS Grid now. Um, and again, when you're doing that, keep in mind that some browsers aren't going to support it, so make sure you you build in some backwards compatibility into there in some sort of way. Uh, so that's really all I have to say about layouts. I don't know if you have anything to jump in. Like, how do you structure your your sites right now? Do you use like do you still use block model, or you, you're saying you're you're moving on to Flexbox, right? Yeah. So basically, we were we were building custom sites, and the majority of them, just due to familiarity, was box model. And then, um, you know, I started looking at Flexbox, obviously, like I had looked at it here and there, um, you know, for I'm going to say the upwards of a year. And then mm -hmm. I really sort of started diving into it because we started using Bootstrap because some sites did like some of our client sites need to be kind of spun up really rather quickly. And then I kind of realized like, hey, you know, I'm putting, you know, the D the D dash flex class on stuff. But realistically, I could just be doing the property display flex. 
Um, like, yeah, so I never like, understood that. It's a good, it's a good point. Like, why, why even use Bootstrap? I, I guess to make it so that everything's in like your HTML to make it easily readable or something. I don't, I don't know. Well, that that that's kind of the that kind of goes back to that comment I was saying where things are starting to replace the libraries and frameworks that we have, right? Like people were saying, oh, yeah. like. Like, like, I don't really use the grid on Bootstrap much. I was using it more for, because I, I, I thought it'd be easier to lay out. But then since Bootstrap adopted Flexbox, it's like, okay, well, now you guys are complementing each other. Like, like Bootstrap's so useful. I'm not saying it isn't. But, like, it's it they complement each other so closely now. Whereas before, it was like Bootstrap and these other, like, you know, similar similar frameworks or libraries, or you want to call them, were, was adding a functionality. Now it's like, it's just like a, like an interface for what's existing, I think, is what's mm-hmm. there, right? Because like you can use – there's like quick quick uh, things like you can put together such as like forms and stuff like that on Bootstrap. But you're right. If you're just doing it for a layout and you're doing custom everything else, you know, unless you need it to be like something in like a template, like for like a template engine or – you know what I mean? Because then people can easily change the colors and that sort of thing. Um, realistically, if you're doing like a really easy layout, you're probably going to be – better off just doing flex like right in your css because it's just going to be quicker um so with that being said um a lot of a lot of what html all the things.coms is like is as it's being built right now is flexbox now like a lot of it is that because like because the the control is just there like i wouldn't even want to use a block and i do use block uh, like a box model like you know here and there certainly like i'll use it for certain things i'll be like oh i can't get this to a line right like i just don't want to like look up all the different methods i'm just going to use the box model here so i think that's one thing to kind of keep in mind is is even though these are you know essentially upgrades of each other it's just more tools in the box it's not like they're replacing each other Mm -hmm. you know no one's going to be like oh man this is box model what the hell um you know it's still going to work it's still going to function just fine it's just it's just different it's like a different way of engineering the same thing um, I think that's, I think I'm going to move on maybe to, uh, ease of use, uh, unless you had other, any other comments there, Mike. No, no. Yeah. That, that's good for layouts. Um, so I'm going to move on to, I'm going to move on to ease of use there then. Um, so what I mean by ease of use is kind of like what, what I thought was easiest to learn, what I think is easiest to do, etc. So for me, the box model, and this is total personal opinion for me, the box model was the easiest to learn. Um, I found it more human readable myself. Um, however, I will say that Flexbox is much easier to do complex responsive layouts using less commands and less of that micromanaging that I mentioned in the first segment. So, um, like box model to me, like the padding, the, the, the borders, the margins and that, and using, you know, just those few, uh, you know, base, base options, base properties to sort of set everything up really made sense to me. It really clicked and you really tried, you really start understanding document flow. Um, with box model, I thought, I think box model is a really good way to start understanding how the DOM and how, um, like a, like a rendered, a rendered page kind of flows. Like you'll, you'll see that in, in a lot of like beginner classes or a lot of like, ab, like it's more of an abstract com, um, comment when you say like the flow of a page but it's like Mm -hmm. the way the way that i the way that i i think of it is is back in the day i used to add an element to a page and i used to not know where it was going to be at all and then i'd have to go and like like essentially find it like this is when i was just learning i had to go and like find the element and then then move it around to where i wanted now i understand generally oh i'm putting this in i haven't put all the properties in so it's going to be you know locked to the left side it's going to be aligned on the left which is fine for what I'm doing right now, you know, and then I can go and like work on this other section. Like I understand the flow of the page. And I think personally that box model kind of let, like kind of helped me learn that like a little bit easier, I think. However, um, with the flex box, you get a lot of, you get a lot of, uh, functionality sort of right out of the box. So the, like I was mentioning, uh, how something like bootstrap really complements Flexbox Well, it almost feels like Flexbox, just in its like native form and it's most pure form is almost, is almost a library or, an, or, or, or something, or like, a like a, it, it, it's an enhancement. It's almost like a plugin to CSS, um, as it, as it stands, it, it, it has a lot of functionality there. It's, it's very easy to get, to get content blocks to line up nicely. It's very easy to get designs to flip from the horizontal to the vertical, 
Um, it's very easy to do that, but it's not, in my opinion, very human readable. It's confusing when there's justify content and then align items and then those co those properties quote unquote flip when you change the the flex direction from you know, like from column to row it's just it's just a little confusing to me and so like just in terms of like being readable being human readable to me it's just a little bit confusing um and that that might just be personal opinion and it might be because i learned box model first um i'll kind of let you take out take take it away mm -hmm. mike with this yeah so for for me uh it's kind of like the opposite i I also started with box model, but I found it to be kind of like the most confusing uh, of the three because I, I have a little bit of a different story of how I became like how I got into more, more layout stuff. And that was I went to I went for box model straight to CSS grid. Um, and I was like, holy gee, like the, the difference between the two is massive. Like it is huge when you when you compare them. I think like like you said, that stepping stone of Flexbox is a huge one. Right. Uh, and and it it definitely puts stuff into perspective too uh, but when you go from box model to grid it's even like it's an even bigger leap and you're kind of like you almost wonder why there was even a block model to begin with like that that's how that's how big of a leap it was for me uh, but the, when I realized that you know CSS grids not supported by every single browser I had to go back to Flexbox and that was kind of like a good intermediary for me it was a good step down and it still had a lot of the functionality that I liked from CSS grid um but it, it was supported and everything and so ease of use for me is again i think flexbox is number one for ease of use then it goes grid then goes box which is interesting that we have like completely different opinions on that but that's i think that's fine it's objective right um so it's it's uh i think it's because just just like i was saying the the alignment stuff and you're you're right in the fact that when it when it flips like from column to row uh, from yeah from column to row direction and those justify content and align content flip as well uh, that confuses me still and i do it like i've been doing it pretty consistently and i still kind of like go in check oh doesn't work have to flip it to align content that's kind of annoying but i think that's just me or like just just like just us not bothering to read up on it enough or something like that it, 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 again it's not a big hindrance for me i just check one flip to the other and it works so it's fine uh, but other than that, I don't see like literally don't see any other reason to use box anymore. Now that I at least have both, maybe if I couldn't use grid as much, I could see going back to box for some things. But I can't like I can't even think of an example right now where that would be uh, where that would be used. So yeah, that that's where that's where my ease of use kind of lines up. But uh, I think I'll move on to the next topic unless Matt, you have any comments. Uh, well, one thing I did want to mention is, um, and again, it just might be me me and how I do things but um i find that like you were mentioning how you you don't really see the the need for a box model oftentimes not always but oftentimes for whatever reason um like a footer just kind of seems like it's finer control and needs a lot more micromanaging in general because generally people pack those things with links like legal links links of pages etc etc social links whatever and i find that i actually will use um box model either in part or completely on someone's footer or it, on the content in the footer. I just I don't know whether it's just because it's easier for me to understand it, but I'll mess around sometimes. Like because Flexbox is, I I would equate it to being more automatic than yeah. than something like Box Model, and I find that like that automation, if you will, kind of messes around with like the fine tuning that oftentimes footers require because there's so much in there. So that's okay. just that's just my two cents on that. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so yeah, I'll move on to support. So I think we've already covered it for the most part, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. So box is the most supported. Flexbox is virtually the same. Uh, it's it's I I don't know I don't like uh, we should have checked this before the show, but uh, I'm pretty sure Flexbox is supported just at just the same as box. Uh, and people just didn't use Flexbox for some reason, maybe because of its convoluted nature back then. Uh, I'm not really sure. Anyway, so Flexbox is pretty much virtually the same support, maybe a little bit less. And then Grid is the newest one, the the you know the one that's supposed to take over from everything else. And it's so it, the actual support for Grid, I'll I'll, I'll let people know. Uh, Internet Explorer is not supported. Anything older than version 16 of Edge, which I think is a year old now, as of this podcast, uh, is not supported. So version 16 Edge and above is supported, and then 
older than version 10 of Safari. So Safari version 10 is supported. Anything lower, so 9, any of the 9 point whatevers, are not supported. So that that um, is, brings me to a point where like I had an issue with it. So I think I've already brought this up once, but I'll, I'll kind of quickly go through the story where I built out a client's page, an entire, pretty much an entire application in CSS Grid. Uh, and it was great. Like I loved it. Everything was great. And I, I went to go check it on my iPad. Everything worked great on the iPad because it was a, it was actually for uh, for iPads and specifically for iPad Pros, uh, first generations. And so what happened was when the client went to go open it, everything was janked. Everything was messed up. And he opened it up on the, on an iPad Pro and everything. But what I didn't know was that when iPad Pro shipped, it actually shipped with uh, Safari nine. And CSS Grid was not natively supported in Safari 9. So I just went through that whole process of making an entire page in CSS Grid, like, sorry, an entire application pretty much in CSS Grid. And I had to go back and, you know, redo everything in Flexbox. Uh, it wasn't a huge deal because, again, like I mentioned before, Flexbox does share a lot of similarities with Grid, uh, especially in, in terms of the one-dimensional uh, justifying aligning content. Uh, it's just when you, you, you'll have to create more divs and more encapsulation uh, to create your full-on grid layout with Flexbox. So lesson learned, and I kind of want to just point this out again because it's important to know who, where and who is going to be using your content. Like I said before, like that, if you're, if you're developing for, a, for instance, an auto body collision association, they're going to be a, a little bit of an older clientele, a little bit less tech savvy. You're going to have to expect them to be using stuff like Internet Explorer because they don't care as long as they can check their emails. And some of them don't even have emails like, <laughs> you know, what I mean? like as long as they can check something on the Internet, maybe the weather, they're, they're going to use it. They're not going to care if it's going to take them five minutes to even load a Web page. So it, it's important to kind of know that your audience, um, I think it's also important to know where to cut it off. So if only like if you're expecting most of your most of the people to be tech savvy and most of the people to have moved on from Internet Explorer, I don't think there's any reason for you to be developing for Internet Explorer. I think you should be leveraging the newer features. You should move on and you should force people to kind of up, upgrade. But again, depending on who your actual main clientele are. And that's why I say main, because like if your main clientele isn't those people that are using IE, you're good. If they are, then maybe you should consider it still. Um, so that's my spiel on support. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, Matt. Uh, just quickly looking on can I use, I just kind of looked up CSS inline block and then CSS, um, like, C the, yeah, CSS flex. Uh, so uh, it's it's virtually the same. Like mm -hmm. it's 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 most users. So I'm just going to like there's a lot there's a lot of like versions listed here. And I just kind of like I said, I quickly looked. They look, you know, it's virtually the same for me. It might actually be exactly the same, but in mm -hmm. terms of the usage global, it's like 95.71% of global users um, use use uh, CSS flex flexbox, and then inline block is 96.13%. So it's like because it's still it's they're both using the display property um, to be to be clear yeah. for everyone. So like uh, like it's virtually the same. Like you're saying that they were they're vi like virtually the same compatibility. That it, it is virtually the same. So when you say like uses, you mean like uh, browsers that support it? Is that is that what that means? Um, it just says it just says in in terms of can I use it's it's literally just oh. the usage the usage of, of it. I'm just I'm just looking at like the real world spec just because there's a there's like yeah. there's a quite a large compatibility chart um, mm -hmm. here for like all the different browsers. Yeah. But, so so we can just assume that that 96 percent of everyone can use that. That's my, that's my assumption. Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, it, unless you're really concerned in your project, if you're, if mm -hmm. for like, you know, around four to 5% between those two, um, of people, but like, so for example here, um, as an example for IE 11, IE 11 is, is full green for, uh, inline block, but it's like a yellowish green, which means like slightly less compatible more yeah. or less in, uh, for IE 11 for the flex box. I'm just curious how old IE 11 is. IE 11. It's really yeah, stable. so it's, it's partial support due to large amount of bugs present. Um, so browser IE version 11, is October twenty thirteen. Yeah, October so twenty thirteen. <laughs> yeah, so that I mean, like that's not that's not. 
I guess that, that's not too long ago. So that means Flexbox. So that means Block probably does have a quite a long time on it. So when when is Block not supported? Is there anything there about that? Or um, well, it says it says here. Um, if I go to and just like I said, I'm in, I, and I'm going to link these these two pages for your guys to if you guys want to look at them. But in uh, IE, it just says 11, and then I click on it, it just says supported. Um, okay. But it's usage. Enough. So for example, it's usage. It's global usage is 2.66%. And that that is uh, listed as that's in the inline block. And then if I go to the other one, I think this might do the, the IE support uh, percent numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so two point six six percent of global um, is under under the usage there is IE eleven, because you got to okay. remember here a lot of guys will switch from Internet Explorer to something else on their computers. Yeah, and all those all those older even those older versions would would support it. Like a a Chrome from that time would definitely support Flexbox fully. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So just some. So yeah. So they're very they're very very similar because they're both older, but Box is definitely older. Box as yeah. Block is definitely older. Okay. Well, it's good to know. All right. Um. So I don't know. Like uh, I think I don't. I'm not going to touch on issues because we kind of already discussed them throughout. So I think we're going to move on to our final segment, uh, web news. That sounds good to me. All right. Let's do it. So unobtrusive ads. So what what I mean by that is. I want to talk, I want to have like kind of like a discussion about what ad strategies you're okay with. And it's going to be directed at Matt mostly, but I'm talking to the audience as well. So if you guys actually want to pipe in and, you know, add us on, on Instagram or hashtag us on Twitter, let us know what you think about ad strategies and how you, where you align on our spectrum. Cause we'll, we'll kind of give our, uh, opinions. It's not, there's not going to be any kind of like actual facts and stuff like that about you know this one's the best and this one's no no it's going to be just just our experience not actually putting ads there but actually seeing ads i think that's what we're going to focus on because i think in the future we'll have an episode on ads when we have a little bit more experience with them like where to place them what what to do and stuff like that but i think for now let's just talk objectively let's talk how we feel about the these ads that we see every day and you know how annoyed we are how not annoyed we are and stuff like that so I'll start right away, right off the bat. Uh, so, Matt, what are some ad strategies that you are okay with? And uh, I have a list here, so you can check out that list, but I'll, I'll just uh, read, read out a few here. So, sp- there's sponsored posts, banner ads, so those are like Google ads and stuff like that. There's full-page timed ads, so that's like uh, when, when you go to a page, a news article, and a full page pops up. And it's saying like five seconds until you can skip this ad and there's a full page ad there. Uh, there's sidebar ads where it kind of just like stays in the sidebar the whole time. Uh, then there's the chum box, the, uh, you know, from around the web recommended for you. A bunch of, you know, really random s- stories that aren't really recommended for you, but they're there at the bottom usually of an a- of a article trying to make you like, you know, almost like a suggested feed like in YouTube, but not. Um, so yeah, what's, uh, what's your take? What's your, what are the ads that are, you're okay with out of that list or, or any other that you can think of? Well, sponsored posts. Um, if, if I, I believe that would encompass like in a YouTube video, someone would be like this, this, uh, this thing is sponsored by whatever, or in their feed, you know, equivalent, like, Hey, I really like this hard drive. This is sponsored by the maker of the hard drive, you know, like the Samsung or something. Um, sure. Either that and like, uh, you know, like, a block in on a on a grid based website with sponsored written on it um or like you know on a news based website you're scrolling through the news there's news 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 and then one of them will be will say sponsored specifically mentioned sponsored but it'll it'll almost look like a news article right but it it will be it will say sponsored and it'll be like a an ad for something I'm definitely okay with them when they're not intrusive and when they're disclosed so if it says sponsored or if it's like a different color Uh, that means it's sponsored or if it's like disclosed on Instagram in the caption or however you disclose things on Instagram now. Um, or if it says like, Hey, this is the sponsor for this video. Um, that's a little more intrusive, but I'm okay with that. I will say Mm -hmm. it's a little annoying in videos when it's, there's a YouTube ad, like a standard YouTube, you know, Google ad, whatever you want to call it. And Mm -hmm. then there's also the, the sponsored spot. So it's sort of like, you gotta remember that people are complaining about ads on television. Well, you know, some of these videos are five or 10 minutes and I'm watching four ads sometimes because there's multiple ads at the beginning of a lot of videos. Now I'm getting two or three ads at the beginning of videos now. And then there's like middle ads too. Like, yeah, yeah. There's middle ads, which is like another whole, another whole thing. So, so there's that. Yeah. What about like webpage 
sponsored stuff. Web page sponsored stuff if it's within the grid. So if it's like a blog a blog grid where like there's a collection yeah. of posts, I'm fine with that because as long as it's as long as it's actually shown, um, as long as it's actually like you know like I said different color different whatever, I'm absolutely mm-hmm. fine with that. I don't like them and I don't know whether these would be sponsored posts. I don't like them when they have that stupid and it's really freaking annoying actually when you when you're on mobile and you're scrolling and then a fucking car ad comes like whipping in it's like it like comes like sliding in so you're scrolling and then this like little banner ad scrolls up with you and it's like keep scrolling to make sure you you can read the article and then like you keep scrolling and then the car ad like flies off into the into nowhere you know i don't know mm-hmm. if you've ever experienced those yeah yeah I, i've definitely experienced those those i would say those are definitely obtrusive and like they 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 ruin the flow of the application too like you're in the you're in the way you're in the way of me using your site and yeah. and and 90 percent of the time I mean, not to sound crass, but 90% of the time, I don't care enough about what I'm reading to continue when that happens. It's like, Mm -hmm. it's like if, when that happens, it's like, no, okay, I'm out of here. You know, I I don't, I don't care now. Um, but you know, if they're, if they're done right in those methods that I said, for sure, I would say, I would say I'm fine with, I'm fine with that. That's sponsored posts are probably like a standard way of advertising and I'm totally fine with those. Do you ever click on them? Um, I will click on some, I have clicked on a few Google ads for sure. Um, a lot of the time, if it's something in the video, I will actually just look it up. I won't actually click on if they have a link in the description or whatever. I'll actually just like open another tab and maybe look it up if I'm legitimately interested. Cause like I will use ad, like I will read the odd ad. Like, you know, obviously ads work. Everyone says like, who clicks on ads? Well, I mean, if it's interesting to me, if it's something serious, like, I don't know, a new keyboard or something, you know, a new software that comes out, a new um there's a couple of like you know competitors to webflow for example and those have popped up in my facebook feed um as i as like sponsored posts within my facebook feed and i've i've clicked on those so if it's if it's interesting to me and you know it's not some sort of like scammy looking ad like those stupid flash games that we that used to show up on on everything back in the day uh Mm -hmm. if it's not that you know i'm fine with clicking on them if i'm interested in them okay cool so like okay what what about the any other ones that you're okay with so are you okay with the sidebar ad or the banner ad banner ad yes banner ad yeah and i actually condone those on on uh ad on uh, apps so i like a banner ad because i get used to them being there because they're usually permanent so it's like people always complain like oh this is ad supported this is this this is that well you know the guy needs to be paid somehow the person that that developed the app the app needs to be paid somehow and it's really annoying when like a video ad will pop up and it's like, well, you're going to get more gold if you listen to this ad. Those kind of annoy me because it's like, oh, now I'm going to watch it. Like, it's like almost going, it's like, oh, I'm going to go to the movie theater to watch the previews and then I'm going to come home. Yeah. You know, that's, so you, it's weird. Yeah. So the full t- full page timed ads definitely no go for you then because they, they, like anything, I think anything that ruins the flow of you using the application is, should be a no go. Like it should be so simple, like simple for them not to do that um i think it's a no-go but i i don't mind them when they're optional so something like uh, adventure capitalist i mean i haven't played in years so god knows what it's like now but back when i mm-hmm. played it i there used to be that thing where it would multiply your money by yeah. three times or something like that if you watch an ad and you could watch like i think it was like something like three in a row to get the maximum amount of boost um for like 12 hours or however long it was i'm fine with those because like i am choosing to click on that like it, it's like it, but like, it's, is it's it really a choice when you're like if you don't do that you don't get to play the game to the full extent it, like that that's it, it my is, problem it isn't it isn't because because you almost feel bad that you're not watching an ad at that point is that a problem like i i don't know like i don't know how i feel about those things because like if i choose not to watch an ad say i don't have enough time sometimes it happens and i and i go into a game like adventure capitalist or any sort of idle clicker game everyone knows that like you watch ads you get either coins or you get more time or something a boost um i feel like it's weird i have a weird feeling where i'm like i'm wasting my time here because i haven't watched an ad and made got that boost and i i I don't know if i like that it's a it's it's a good point like a lot of these i mean not Mm -hmm. to bring it into a gaming podcast but a lot of these games as a service um i don't know if the our audience is going to understand what that is but a lot of games as a service where games are constantly updated um and like timing is very crucial in a lot of these modern games now i will say that it feels really bad when you don't get the when you don't get the the full extent 
um, of the of what you're doing, especially if you don't get the full extent of the time you're spending. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say that. So it's one it's one of those things. Like I agree with you there. Like it's not it it is a choice and it isn't. I would say yeah. I would actually more so say like because the thing is is like if I'm designing a game. And a lot of guys don't like banner ads. Like, I don't mind them, but a lot of guys don't like banner ads. I don't want to interrupt you unannounced. Yeah. So the way I would monetize a game off the top would be this. I would put a boost on and make you click the button. But it's you clicking the button and you know what you're doing. I think that's why I'm more okay with it. Yeah. But it is... It's not always there, right? It's not always present. It's not always present and it, and I'm not going to be suddenly be like, oh shit, like it popped up and I was clicking and I clicked on the ad. I know yeah. what I'm getting into, so I'm I'm okay with it because it's a gesture from the user that specifically is like, "Hey, support us, and we'll like give you something in the game." However, it is you are right; it's not as optional as it may seem. If yeah. if you want to play, quote unquote, properly, yeah, or it's a psychological thing. Like it's it, it they really get you psychologically with those things, in my opinion. Um, so okay, so you're okay with sponsored posts for if they're done right. Mm-hmm. You're okay with banner ads right yep um you said what about full page time ads that we did you get like you know what i'm saying with those right well those those ones those ones i think would actually fall into the boat of the the venture capitalist thing where it's like you have to watch this video for two minutes or whatever it is to get the three times bonus i guess yeah that would be but 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 there's no option to do that like the the issue is is that like if you want to go to the next part of the web page you have to watch this ad Oh, so something like a about. like a pre-roll on a YouTube video is like a timed like maybe, but like I'm talking more like uh, I, I think CNET had them and stuff like like where, where you literally click on a news link, and instead of taking you to the news link, it'll take you to a full page ad, and at the top there will be a bar counting down with with ta- time counting down and saying like you can skip once the time counts down. That's like AdFly you know I mean? back in the day, where I mean it still it still exists AdFly, yeah. but um. So, so like, what what about those? I remember those used to be widespread on Reddit as a little as a little aside. I think those are pretty much. I mean, I mean, I haven't seen one in a really long time. Uh, an ad fly, but uh, I don't know if, you, if do you know what ad fly is. I think so. It's like literally like if I want to share a link, I find something cool. What people oh, used yeah, to do yeah. on Reddit is like you you'd be like, hey, I really f- I found this cool screenshot. You'd click on it, and then it would take you to like an ad fly page with an ad, and then the person yeah. who like made that ad fly link would like get a thing, like get like yeah. a, a kickback. And then it would like go to the screenshot eventually. So it's kind of yeah. like those. And that's a no go. That's, okay, that's a no go. That's a no go. Okay. I'm out. Like I, I usually okay. would just close it. Be like, oh, yeah, yeah. I guess so, I'm not learning so, this yeah, today. It's, it's kind of <laughs> like those exactly. Yeah. So so full page ads again. In my opinion, anything that ruins the flow of you looking at content shouldn't shouldn't be done. That that's my opinion. You're you're in uh, the way of using it. Like if your web page is a tool. Like if I'm learning something and yeah. you're in the freaking way. Like get out of here exactly what about okay what about sidebar ads and i want to just just stipulation they stick with you in the page right like so when you're scrolling it's constantly in the sidebar so you the ad's always there but it is in the sidebar so it's not obtrusive i would say i would i want to say that that practice is okay but i've only seen them on really old sites and because the resolution of our screens is so much bigger the fact that some of that real estate because like usually those things will have like a content because, like, people put, like, a content width limiter, right? So yeah. that people with the hyper-wide displays don't have to, like, turn their head 188 degrees to read a line. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's, like, because we, we've had that. I've had that problem, actually, recently. Um, yep. So, like, we ha- we'll have, like, a maximum. Like, it'll be like, okay, th- the maximum width that this thing can go to is, ni- is 1920, right? And then guys yep. on, like, the prop on like the proper screens will make sure the viewport scales and it won't be freaking massive. Well, yep. the problem is, is if it's an older site, like I've seen on these, sometimes that little box thing is like 500 pixels wide or something. And then like, it's like, dude, there's not much of this screen real estate being used. And you're using this like third for the yep. sidebar. So I'm going to say no, but I think that if I've, if I, I don't, I can't think of one in recent mm-hmm. time in, on like a newer site, but if it was a newer site. I think the practice is okay, but the current production that I've seen them in are, is a no go. I think if I was going to a site constantly and I had that constantly follow me while I scroll, I think I would not be going to that site. That's my opinion. I think that's how, like, I, I yeah. So no go for me too then, I guess. Um, okay, and last but definitely not least, the, the, the dreaded chum box. So that's like the, I mean, the bigger, the one of the bigger ones is Tabula, for example. Yeah. 
Um, we have experience with that actually. It's it, it's from it just as a description. It's for it's like the from around the web recommended for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, post things at the bottom. Now we've actually usually, usually really stupid stories like real like celebrity gossip stuff and clickbait for sure. Yeah, like extreme extreme clickbait stuff. Yeah. Usually we've actually have experience with this with Free Photos Hamilton. We were on. We used a, a service and and uh, they're not the ones that I don't think they're the ones that actually provided the chum. Uh, the chum box, but uh, they like it was like a a, par- a party that worked with them or had like an app with them. But we used to use a service called Sumo Me. Um, uh, I think it's still actually installed on on Free Photos Hamilton, and that's that that was for um like they they had like shareable links to the bottoms of pages and that type of thing. And like Sumo Me has a bunch of tools, and one of them is you could add a chum box from I forget which provider they use. And we had that for a while because what it was was it was a credit system, so it was it was free. And what it was was if 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 I showed a bunch of ads, I would get credits, and then my credits, based on the impressions I gave, would then show my ad on other people's chum boxes. Mm-hmm. So when we were trying to like build out, like get more traffic, uh, we gave that a go. But the articles are really stupid, and it really yeah, cheapens like, it really cheapens the page. I feel like someone could make something like that and actually make it good. You know what I mean? Like actually make relevant articles for people. Uh, it, it's kind of creepy though. Like I don't, because you would have to be following their search history. It ha- it, ha- it would pretty much have to be Google. Google would be the only. Maybe Facebook would be the only two companies that could do it because they already know your search history and stuff like that. Yeah. And like they they already do the sponsored ads, banner ads, right? So they could technically do a chum box, probably with sponsored posts like you know what i mean like sponsored uh like medium articles and stuff like that so medium the people the people would give them money to put them in their chum boxes and they would place the actual relevant stuff in in there like i could see it i could see it being done right because it's not obtrusive right it's just it's just annoying when you're like watching like i remember remember techno buffalo had this problem so they gave all their all their ad all their site revenue to a different company to give, to make it more ad friendly. And these people just place chum boxes all over the site. And like, the problem is, is that it's not relevant. So you have content like, Oh, I'm doing a tech review of this uh, cell phone. And then all of a sudden you have how to enlarge your breasts. Yeah. Look at her now. Or like yeah, look whatever. At, yeah, exactly. Look at her now. Where have, where has this celebrity been all this time? Like it, it just like, if it doesn't make sense, and it, it throws you off and throws off your rhythm when you're looking at a web page. Again, I would say it's one of those flow inducing, like without being obtrusive, it somehow destroys the flow of your site. So for me, it's a definite no in the current state. I think it is possible to make it decent. Um, I would say in that same breath, though, there are like Google ads and Google ads don't have, I mean, I don't. But again, it, like they have text ones, but and they also have like banner ones. But realistically yeah. speaking, all it would be, all it would be is a, um, what the hell was that? Did you hear that? Nope. One of my one of my virtual assistants just activated. That was really creepy when we were talking about Google. That really creeped me out. Anyway, yeah. sorry about that. Jesus. <laughs> Woo. Okay. That that really creeped me out. Okay. Um, <laughs> to get back on there, um, I would say that the thing with the thing with Google. Now be quiet now, Google. <laughs> Uh, the thing with Google is that they, like, we already have, like, a li- like you can have, like, ads from Google, right? Like, people put them on their sites for monetization. Sure. I would say that all they have to do is literally change the format of those ads to... She did it again. Um, that, was, she, that was... Oh, God, that's creeping me out. Seriously. Um, all, she, all they have to do is change the, um, the, change the, like, <laughs> the like, format. Of the voice actual ads are destroying your flow. Oh god, that scared the shit out of me too. God, I'm just sweating now yeah. too. Woo. Okay. Woo. Good thing it's in the uh, the web, the web news section, just the editorial yeah, section, yeah, it's, not, it's... Not, not the professional time. Holy god. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if the mic picked that up, but that was really creepy. I, I didn't even no, hear what she said. I got headphones on. I just heard. It I, I didn't hear it either. I didn't hear it either. So it probably didn't. <sighs> but anyway, okay. <laughs> but yeah. So like if they just change like the format, realistically they like that's all I need to do is get a picture and like change the how it looks. But I I just like I think that they would have to provide different content. Like I, what I'm saying is like right now they do web they do ads for like you know products and stuff like that. I think that they would have to do ads for like articles, news articles, and uh, medium posts and stuff like that. 
So people would submit their Medium post into a Google ad, right? Pay for it. Yeah. And that's what would go in those chum boxes. Not that's, that's just not just like Coca-Cola articles, you know what I mean? Like not just Coca-Cola ad. Yeah, you wouldn't want like you wouldn't want Google to like 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 I mean they're not really clickbaity right now, uh, from what I've seen. Yeah. That's a good that's a good question. Like like what type of ad content would need to go into those to make it work? So you remove the clickbaity stuff, but then it's like do standard ads work anymore? Well, even if it was clickbaity, but at least was relevant, like, you know, like it, it, let's say for instance, uh, it's a something to do with technology, a website, something to do with technology, like techno Buffalo, instead of being like how to make your grass grow, grow, grow bigger. It's like five, <laughs> five, five best ways to increase your battery life on your phone. You know what I mean? That, yeah, that's, there you that's go. clickbaity, but that would, that would probably be somewhat relevant. It wouldn't ruin the flow of your site so much. Yeah, I'm reading about, like, a Tesla. I don't need to know how to enhance, like, or, like, yeah. where, where like, Dolly Parton has been. Yeah, I, I, yeah exactly. <laughs> I, I just, I don't understand. That's what I mean. Like, it's recommended for you, but it's obviously not. Because they, it's just garbage ads. So, yeah. So, no to chum boxes as they are right now. Uh, so, let, let's, move, let's move on to the next topic. Um, we've already covered what annoys you. That's fine. Yep. Uh, let's do. Do you think ads on a web page or app are a fair way to monetize, as opposed to you know doing the other stuff like uh, selling microtransactions, uh, premium currency, or just paying for an app? Uh, so, so a freemium ad supported application. So actually, I have a bit of a a bit of a, a not a story, but like a bit of a, a an evolution in thought of this. So mm-hmm. when we were in college, for example, and prior to that, um, we like we weren't entrepreneurs. And so I was sort of like in the boat of the general public and I am generalizing when I say general public. So, um, a lot of people will like have a, have an ad block. They don't want to see ads. They don't want this. They don't want that. They don't want to pay for it. Like they don't want to pay wall. They don't want to, they don't want you to do an advertisement. They don't want you to like, like self plug. They don't, they don't, they don't, you know, all these things. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, well, dude, like I need to be paid in some way. Um, you know, and so I think, I think, the awareness in the public is starting to become a little bit better. Um, I, there's still a lot of people that will complain about ads, um, of course, especially if they're they're too much. Like if there's too if they're, if they're too much, they're too much, and I agree with that. But I would say that like when we became entrepreneurs, like slowly over time, like I don't have an ad block even installed as far as I know. Maybe it's disabled, but it like it's at least disabled is what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have it on at all. Like I see ads on stuff. Um, I I'm fine with in app in-app purchases if they're if i'm not being gouged i'm fine with i'm fine with banner ads like i said on apps because i get used to it i'm fine with ad supported ads uh apps because i realize that sometimes an uh, an app is very simple and people won't pay for it so they need to there needs to be ads in there and i i, I like uh, my uh opinion of this has really changed since we became entrepreneurs because the term sellout comes out a lot especially when you're talking about media stuff Like, oh, you know, you used to write a lot and now you keep, you know, plugging, uh, I don't know, the shaver that sponsored you or, or like the shoes that sponsored you or the desk that sponsored you. And like, you're a sellout. It's like, well, yeah, because I also, I also have a bank account, you know, and I also need to pay the bills and I also need to have money. Um, so my opinion on this has changed. And so, yes, I do to answer the question. Yes, I think it's acceptable. I think it's a fair way to monetize. Um, I think it's a good way to, I think it's a good way to, um, have the balance of like, you know, the internet is more or less free in terms of like payment other than the ISP payment. You know, you're using most sites with the exception of some of the paywall for free. And then you're also having, you know, the person's being supported and then they're being kind of constantly supported too. So it's like, if I keep going there, they get paid every time. Whereas, you know, if it, 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 I mean, I, I mean with a subscription, the same thing. But it's, you know, a lot of people are getting kind of sick of subscriptions too now. So it's like, I think it's the good middle ground where I think you're going to get people bitching about it uh, to, for lack of a better way to describe it. I think you're going to get people bitching about it, but I don't care. Like I, I, I take the feedback seriously. You know, if we were doing advertisements and we started losing ratings Mm -hmm. and people are like, this is just like, like riddled with ads. Like I really don't like it that's one thing where it's like okay maybe we need to draw back the ads like the whole techno buffalo thing where like they got overridden with ads like that that's a more complex situation but let's just hypothetically said let's just like hypothetically say that they chose to do that if they chose to do that and then they didn't and then they didn't take the feedback which they did and they did not choose to do it 
um, you know, it'd be pretty bad if they, if that was their plan. Like, oh, we'll just like, like throw ads everywhere. It's like, well, like, come on. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not like, you know, you go, you get into, um, it's not like, it's not like you go to the fair and every single time you want to look at an ex like an, an exhibit, you have to pay. And there's like a window where you have to like put like a, a thing in to like open the shutter to look at the exhibit. And then they never go to the next one. I put a loony in the next like vending thing to open up the next shutter yeah. to look at it. You know, you pay to get in and then sure you pay for the rides, whatever, but it's like you're paying to get in and experience a bunch of stuff. And then there's like a little bit of extra with the rides in, and, and it's, it's kind of the same with a, with a, a website where you come in, there's ads. So you're sacrificing some real script, some screen real estate, um, or you're buying a subscription or whatever. But yeah, I think it's acceptable. What I yeah. will say... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. What I was going to say, what I will say is I disagree with buying a premium service that removes ads and then slowly them moving ads into it. Into the premium service? Absolutely. That happens? Twitch Prime is now... Now they've actually removed the feature. Oh, Twitch yeah, Prime no right. longer has ad-free viewing. Yep. Now that what that's a little bit different because they physically removed the feature. They didn't mm-hmm. just say like, "Oh, we're just gonna have ads for Twitch Prime users." Like they they like they removed the feature and they like let people know. So that's one thing. Um, but I I've, I've been told and like I've done my research myself, but I've been told by other people, several other people, that cable TV, the the selling point of cable TV when it first came out was that there was no ads, and then they slowly started working t- like commercials in. Yeah, people and, just want more money. But but now, if you think about this, and this is total hypothetical, if YouTube starts taking off, which it has, but if YouTube starts taking off to the point where TV literally is virtually dead, so it's dying now, I would say if it if it is, you know, pretty near eliminated, and most people are on YouTube, and a lot of people have YouTube Premium subscriptions, I wouldn't yep. be surprised if they start putting ads in there. I wouldn't premium be ads. I wouldn't be surprised if they start putting Netflix ads. There's like some ads for their own series in Netflix. I wouldn't be surprised if they start selling ad space in on yeah, Netflix. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Imagine a commercial break. I don't, I don't. I don't agree with it. I think. I think like eventually. I think that what's happening right now is the internet is turning into TV. Like it, it the, the all the video on demand services. There used to be just Netflix. Now there's Hulu, Netflix, Disney's coming out with their own. Like Fox is coming out with their own. Like the every everyone is coming out with their own video on demand service. So what are you doing? You have to buy all the channels, just like before. It's, Will there be a package smart. deal? I don't know, but probably not. Uh, well, like, there might be. be there might be a, a liaison company where they where they yeah. come out and they they like this company doesn't have their own streaming service. They just liaison the thing, and you could buy package one, which has like ne- like the top three: Netflix, HBO, and someone else. And then yeah. package two has, you know, like, HBO and this or like whatever. It's frustrating to the consumer. Under, it's under ugh, I, I can't say it's understandable but it is like it's understandable why they're doing it they're you make way more money being the sole service provider of your content especially if your content is so important like disney makes sense to me like it sucks hugely like i wish that they would just keep their stuff on netflix because then it's just one subscription but like they're they have so much content and it's so important to people that i can see where they're going to make a lot of money and it that's the problem with a lot of these things. It's like, where do you draw the line? Like, yes, I'm okay with people monetizing, like putting, putting ads on their site, but where do I draw that line? Like how far do they go uh, until I'm like, no, I'm not going on the site anymore. And like, I'm, I'm a little bit different than you. I use an ad block, but on the sites, the people that I want to support, I turn it off. Right. Like I, I, I don't like the web as it is right now for the most part. A lot of sites like uh, I, I, I'm into sports, so I go to NFL and NHL.com. They're made by the same people, and they're very ad heavy. Right. And it's so ad heavy that I'm like it actually hinders my use of the applica- of, of the website. Like it's every click I, I go, a autoplay ad pops up. Like NFL.com literally has like video and audio autoplay ads popping up all the time. Like I would just leave it, even if even if I don't touch anything. Like I press. And I'm just watching the scores of a game, not even the game itself, just the scores. I just want to like, you know, I keep it in the background. All of a sudden I'll have a Ford truck commercial go on like full blast volume. See that, that's sellouty to me because, because it's like, it's like, like, honestly, does, does, does the NHL or NFL or any of those big leagues need money? Look at what the players are being paid. Like I don't really watch sports, but like I hear the numbers. 
It's millions. I don't, I don't think that a lot of these, like, I don't think the money trickles down to even the league. I think it's just the people that make these sites. So I think instead of, you know, paying to make a site and maintain it, they just take all the revenue for the ads. And the NHL and NFL are like, ah, we don't care. Like, at least we have a site up. Oh, that that's interesting. Like maybe like yeah. see, there's a lot of stuff like that that happens in the background that you never see. It's like, you know, I'm I've yeah. already pointed the finger saying, like, hey, you guys are already rich. Why are you guys like plastering us with ads? Like, you know, I mean if you want to have ads in some places, like it's a business fine. But if it's over if it's over, you know, encumbering, but that's a good question, is like what if it what if it's like a web agency and their only stream of revenue from the NFL or whoever or the NHL is literally is literally just like, okay, you guys, like, we don't know what the deal is, but like, maybe it's like, hey, you guys, we're not going to pay you guys to make the site, mm-hmm. but we're going to let you make the site for us. It's going to be the official site of the league. So there's going to be tons of traffic and you guys take all or a portion of the ad revenue. Yeah. And like, that's a huge server cost. So there's so much traffic, you know, so maybe they have to do it. Like, we don't know the whole situation, but if, yeah, it, I'm, it, I'm if, sh- if there's a big money pool there, like if it is the league themselves, come on guys, yeah. like that's sellouty to me. Yeah. personally if you but see like for a stand for a regular user it feels sellouty when they don't know the full story like i'm 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 95 percent sure that it's my like i'm pretty sure i've read about it because um recently like i know that all of the major sports sites are made by the same company okay okay so, so maybe it just, it's something like that yeah yeah it's not it's it's just like they're they're offering a service and they're taking like maybe they only take a percentage of the ad revenue but regardless they're taking a big chunk and that's why they make these sites for free or that's why they make the sites at a lower rate anyway that that is a that is a strategy right that's an ad strategy so keep that in mind i don't know i think um let's uh let's get on to the next the next question the, the final question here uh, sounds good do you care what company's ads are served to you? I.e. like if you hate Coca-Cola, are you going to be mad at the at the serving of, of, of a Coca-Cola ad to you? Myself, no. Not necessarily. Uh I am more of a Pepsi fan, just a disclaimer there. Yeah, that's why I used the Coke example. Uh a vintage Pepsi collector as well. But yeah. um Hmm, that's a good uh no i would say i would say no i would say that uh repetition is the thing that gets me it's like i'm not gonna be like man fuck like because i don't necessarily like the iphone too much for example Mm -hmm. like i'm more of an android guy obviously so it's it's like i'm gonna see iphone ads i'm not gonna get mad that i saw an iphone ad but i might start getting a little annoyed if it's constantly thrown in my face but there's no way to maybe target that down so precisely because it's like this guy has an ad profile that says tech iPhone equals tech, then show him ad, you know, you could, yeah. there's like some more, well, probably a lot more complexity to the, uh, algorithm, but generally speaking, like some of that stuff is going to get to me. So mm-hmm. I, I think I'm on the fence of that. I would say that repetition would be the thing that ticks me off. If I really like Samsung phones, repetition might not pick, might not tick me off as much. I might not tick me off at all, for example. But if, if it's if it's if it's That's repetition if it's repetition then then yes i think i think i think it's repetition for that one okay. i don't know about you but no it's a tough one like uh i i think for me it's the same probably i don't i see i don't treat ads very like i don't take them at face value anyway like i very very rarely will click on an ad ads to, ads to me are just like they're serving a purpose to some for someone else I'll click on an ad if a I want to support the people that put the ads there, right? Or or I don't know. Like there's ne- there's never really a point where I'm like, oh my god, this is the ad exactly what I'm looking for. Like I, I very rarely have that. Um, to say that, but then again, like in so, there's some email marketing campaigns that I've I've, I've been interested in. Obviously, like the, like the, that. I don't know if that considered an ad. It probably is. Yeah, like, to an extent. Yeah, yeah. Like so, like sometimes they'll send like sale notifications and email marketing campaigns. I click on those pretty often. Um, so maybe it's just like depending on what the actual ad is. So that's just like I'm not gonna say like I, I avoid everything, but mo- for the most part, I'd say like any of those banner ads or stuff like that. I have I don't click on uh so to me it doesn't matter what's there i think 
the big thing that I think we both agree on with the whole Chumbox discussion is we at least want it to be somewhat relevant to the page so that it's not like jarring you away from the content. Um, like I'm okay. I'm okay with them knowing that I like tech so that at least they can put an ad for technology and not for like penis enlargement. I will say non-targeted ads of any type piss me off. Yes. I will say that actually. I, I, and that's good. That is kind of a, a very polarizing topic as well, because a lot of people don't like targeted ads because they, they think that they know too much about them. Right. So they'd rather receive, I guess they would rather receive the penis enlargement ads. Um, over a targeted ad because they don't want people to know what their habits are like. It's almost like know. it's almost like a constant chum box to an extent because I don't think the chum yeah. boxes are very targeted if they're targeted at all. So they're it's not, like yeah. so like like I'm I'm fine with it showing me if I was looking at cameras on Amazon, I'm fine with it showing me cameras, you know, everywhere and people are like, "Oh, I see camera everywhere," but it's like yes, but there's that there's that repetition again, but at least yeah. it's something better than fucking like, yeah. you know, something stupid like or something totally unrelated like don't don't you're not gonna sell me a truck you're just not gonna no. do it so like go over there you know what i mean like yeah. you're not gonna sell me that truck i'm not gonna buy that truck <laughs> like, so, so you know? I, think, I think we're in agreement on that one to to a certain degree so i think i'm, I'm okay with them serving me ads like for companies that i don't particularly like because it's just an ad like whatever i can i can put it off to the side um for the most part but i think it's the it's it's not about the companies it's about what the actual ad is sometimes that pisses me off yeah yeah i i i would say that is is mm -hmm. it, it it it's the delivery of it too like if it's a really if it's a really um arrogant ad sometimes i find some apple ads to be a little bit arrogant sometimes the tone <laughs> of the, the tone of the ad will kind of piss me off yeah or even if it's like even a stupid one where like one company is making fun of the other even if it's even if it's the company i like making fun of the company i don't I'm just like, okay, stop. I don't want to see this again. Fair enough. It's like, I saw it once. Ha ha. Mm -hmm. The other guy's bad. That's why yeah. I'm your customer. You've already yeah. sold me. <laughs> Go away now. I don't know. But yeah. But yeah. I think uh, I think on that note, let's uh, let's wrap it up for today. Yeah. Um, actually, one other thing I did want to actually add to this little piece. Just one really cool. quick. Um, the one thing I will say I don't like is when and this was like a trend with bloggers is when there's like an ad template that everyone tells you to do make sure you have the newsletter pop-up come up for the very first time for like a new user make sure you have the newsletter thing come up then have the share thing fly in then come and then have like another thing pop up that says like hey you're new here would you like some of this like free stuff then have something else being like hey we have merch like like one of the biggest trends was, was that was, um, I mean, there was like variations of it, but was like the newsletter thing popping up. And yes. it, and I remember like all the memes and stuff on Reddit of like, man, like I literally have never seen your site before. I want to read about X thing that I looked up. Yeah. I don't going to subscribe to your newsletter right now. The, the weird thing is, is I've read many, many articles saying that that is like, apparently the highest convert rate which it like, is, I, yeah. I, I don't know but who does that who like when it when they first go to the site who's like oh yeah i'll put my email in here if, if you do that i i don't know what to say to you are we are we in an algorithmic bu uh, bubble are we in an algorithmic bubble where we are surrounded by guys who are tech savvy because we're tech savvy we're surrounded by techies or at least people that know what the hell they're doing with tech True. And so, and so we're like, and, and our, and our ads are, as we've said, our ads are algorithmic. Are we, are we in this circle where, you know, we're protected? Whereas the guys who are non-techie at all, have never done anything techie in their lives, but they use tech because it needs to be used, uh, in their job email or whatever. Are they like, Oh, there's an email box here. Like, are, is that, is that the mentality outside of the techie space? Oh, there's a, it's Oh, there's, a, there's, there's an email box here <laughs> and they possible. just type in their email. I don't know. Yeah, Maybe a, re a regular user will type in their email because like they clicked on an article and they liked the title I, I don't know like I, I i don't know the reasoning but i could see that being a possibility right this is this is why i delete my uh my netflix profile every now and then i'm too algorithmic it'll just show me like the same like 10 videos like yeah, yeah. oh man check out this video you like this one so check that one out it's like I already check that one out we'll check this yeah. one out now because it's in the same category it's like you know i do like more than just one category yeah. So you got to check all the categories. So anyway, that's a little, there's a little tidbit. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're good now. Uh, I'll yep. run the old conclusion. 
So uh, thanks for listening, and make sure you do not miss an episode by subscribing on the platform of your choice. Make sure you leave a review or uh, a a like or a comment or whatever on the the subreddit or on the platform that you're listening to this on. You can follow us on the socials, at HTML, all the things for Facebook and Instagram, uh, at HTML, everything for Twitter. We're on Medium. We're also on GitHub. Uh, We also would like to thank our uh, Patreon uh, supporters, or in this case, supporter, uh, which is at the uh, the podcast promoters, uh, the podcast promoters tier. Um, I'm going to let you uh, say the name so I don't uh, butcher it there, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Grisha. Um, So remember that we are also on Patreon, so patreon.com slash HTML, all the things. Check out the tiers. Uh, Maybe you want to be featured on the show. Maybe you want to just support us, whatever you would like. Uh, And uh, like I said, comment and review, and uh, we are signing off.